give it up to Laura. Come on. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, uh, it's Wednesday nights, especially for us in South Brooklyn. It's a, kind of a hall, so thanks for coming. So uh, I had, we had prepared a kind of a longer um, set of images, but they're a little bit complicated, so I thought I would just uh, talk a little bit um, about the history that lay behind uh, the workshop, and then the, these guys, uh, Rashida and David, it, it, quite obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, having lived through it, are much better positioned to talk about the workshop itself. Uh, so I'll just uh, give those remarks, and then uh, we'll look at just a little bit of images and sound and listen to um, some of the other members of UMBRA uh, speak about their experiences. Uh, on the evening of September 19th, 1960, members of the Harlem Writers Guild gathered at Sarah E. Wright's Lower East Side apartment to hear John Oliver Killens read from his work in progress, the Second World War novel, and then we heard the thunder. As Wright recalled, Killens had barely begun his reading when the phone rang. The call was for John Henry Clark, uh, the historian, and after a moment he put down the receiver and announced, Fidel Castro is moving to Harlem, to the Hotel Teresa, right now. They don't want him at the Shelburne. Described as orgiastic primitives by the mainstream media, the Cuban delegation first planned to pitch tents in Central Park, a move intended, quote, to embarrass Washington beyond measure, as well as vividly dramatize Cuba's global position as a victim of North American discriminatory treatment and aggression. Instead, on the advice of the newly founded Fair Play for Cuba Committee, to which Wright and many other Writers Guild members belonged, Castro moved uptown, quote, a ghetto routinely neglected by local and national officials alike, writes historian Cynthia Young, was suddenly a politically significant site. Symbolically, Castro had moved the UN uptown, centering the third world, both uh, Cuba and Harlem, at the very heart of the first world, end quote. Castro's visit restaged African-American links to anti-colonial movements, disorienting a, pl a global political theater and turning the presumably passive spectators into the spectacle itself. While the move to the Hotel Teresa may have resulted from inspired strategizing on the part of the Cuban delegation and fair play, the mass demonstration of support for Cuba and the media images that it produced, uh, including Alfred Hitchcock's depiction in his 1969 spy thriller Topaz, also reflected the sustained redlining of left-wing and grassroots black political organizations within the city's mainstream electoral politics. W.E.B. Du Bois reflected on Harlem's contemporary political place in a 1952 uh, letter to Alpheus Hunton protesting the Council on African Affairs decision to relocate uptown from West 26th Street. Du Bois uh, wrote, quote, no international agency belongs today in Harlem. It has neither the contacts nor the inspiration there. Our programs go far beyond the provincial American Negro program into the programs of Africa and Asia, and we have a great center here in the accessible part of New York. Martha Biondi, historian of post-World War II civil rights struggle in New York, writes that Harlem's significance as a resurgent emblem of racial oppression and political struggle was in direct proportion to the increasing fragmentation of black city politics uh, into, quote, a series of separate struggles in the boroughs of Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens. Growing class divisions among African Americans were visible, uh, visibly manifest in New York's topography as the city's growing black middle class neighborhoods in Queens were spatially and politically cut off from the largest black neighborhoods in Harlem and Bed-Stuy. This political and residential landscape of discrete black constituencies distinguished New York from cities such as Chicago and Detroit where black populations were more concentrated in one location. On the other side of this fragmentation uh, and this color line that moved with it, writing in Holiday Magazine in 1949, E.B. White, a voice, the name is telling, voiced the integrationist metaphor embedded in a singular new construction, the architecture of the United Nations buildings and the search for an appropriate site on which to build them, a re-territorializing of post-war New York guided by that segregationist city construction coordinator, Robert Moses. Quote, along the East River, Wright wrote, White wrote, from the raised slaughterhouses of Turtle Bay, as though in a race with the spectral flight of planes, men were carving out the permanent headquarters of the United Nations, the greatest housing project of them all. In its stride, New York takes on one more interior city to shelter, this time, all governments and to clear the slum called war. In 1991, 
during the construction of the new General Services Building in Lower Manhattan, graves were discovered at a depth of 24 feet beneath the surface. What was excavated and eventually marked was the nearly forgotten history of the African American communities that interred their dead in what a 1755 city map called the Negro's Burial Ground. With that hallucinatory description of the race with a disembodied technological future of the UN as, quote, the greatest housing project of, of them all, New York schizophrenically absorbed one more interior city. White unconsciously frames the contemporaneous battle against the segregation of Stuyvesant Town and the other post-war housing developments. He also gestures unknowingly to the little known chapter of the civil rights movement in which activism thwarted the extension of segregation to aircraft travel, commercial aircraft travel, and beyond the US to that decolonizing world that most Americans were unaware of. While Martha Biondi argues that the opening of the UN brought the leaders of, a newly independent, of newly independent African states to New York, creating occasions for black transnational networking, the rise of neocolonial African elites and the Cold War pulverization of interracial and cross-class domestic political alliances heightened the obvious contradictions of Pax Americana. Sarah E. Wright had traveled to Cuba in July of 1960 with other members of the Harlem Writers Guild and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, including Julian Mayfield, John Henry Clark, Richard Gibson, Leroy Jones, and Harold Cruz, uh, the trip that Jones would describe in his celebrated essay, Cuba Libra. Following the increasing suppression of the Civil Rights Congress, the Council on African Affairs, and other groups associated with the mid-century left liberal coalition, anti-colonial activism appeared to decline only to be remobilized by two decisive events, the first being Castro's victory, and the second being the murder, we might say the lynching, of Patrice Lumumba. The crowd around the Hotel Teresa included supporters of Lumumba during the onset of this crisis of decolonization that began in July 1960 and ended provisionally with the Prime Minister's murder in January 1961. Sarah Wright wrote about this event uh, in To Do With On Guard, saying, the gaze of our Harlem Writers Guild was focused not only on the South, we were also at one with the seething ghettos of the North, our ears attuned to Malcolm's message, and it was the year of Africa. We threw ourselves into solidarity work for the great freedom movements of the Congo, fought, fought to head off the assassination of Lumumba, linked arms and hearts with the South African freedom struggle, supported the arms struggle of Angola and Mozambique against Portuguese rule, were in the forefront of bringing a consciousness of Africa to our people. We initiated petitions to the UN, peacefully picketed, and forcefully imposed ourselves upon UN proceedings. Uh, she said later, uh, in terms of that, uh, after a, a fundraiser, this is, I'll just kind of summarize some of this, so I'm not reading so much, but by the fall of 61, they're organizing, On Guard is organizing fundraisers, often involving people like Max Roach and Abby Lincoln, uh, and then as a result, uh, they organized around the moment where uh, U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, gave his first address to the U.N. Uh, in, on uh, February 16th, uh, 1961, uh, and uh, Wright and Rosa Gee and a number of other writers uh, got access to the viewing uh, gallery at the United Nations and in the middle of Stevenson's speech uh, began to stand up and chant, now is the time, and uh, to shut, really, that was the first time actually the UN had been shut down uh, at that moment in its history, uh, and it became a kind of a very galvanizing moment for many other activists. Um, in a way, it was sort of the end of On Guard because at that moment of the attention, the press attention that it received, uh, the, United, uh, the New York Times covered that protest front page and had photographs of Calvin Hicks, who was uh, one of the co-organizers of On Guard uh, and close to Umbra founding member Tom Dent. Uh, was beaten and uh, thrown out and arrested, and those photographs of him being beaten were on the cover of the, of the uh, uh, New York Times the next day. Uh, so those are some the kind of crucial moments, and I just wanted to frame those. Lumumba, this is after his capture and before he's sort of taken off to be killed, and then Emmett Till, uh, of course, on the other side, slightly earlier in 1955. His, the, these were two lynchings that had very different um, uh, associations, and kind of frame the international and the domestic uh, politics that On Guard really represents. And I'll, I'll just finish those comments about On Guard uh, with some remarks by playwright uh, Virginia Hughes, or as she was much better known, Aisha Rahman, who just passed uh, this past year, 
uh, who would later capture these kind of interconnections in a brief uh, short memoir she called Living in the Black Arts Movement, in which she links her past to Harlem, as we were discussing, which On Guard really rep represents a kind of uptown organization before we get to the Lower East Side, which will be the focus of, of the actually Umrah and the, the uh, members here, in which she links her past in Harlem to the mid-century left, while the Lower East Side represents a condition of possibility, uh, a very different condition. The Harlem of my girlhood, uh, Ramon writes, was one where seminal curators of the Schomburg collection guided me through Du Bois, where on 116th Street and Lenox Avenue, PS 184, white communist teachers exiled to teach in Harlem taught their pupils about Langston Hughes and Harlem Renaissance writers with a vengeance, where New York communist leader Ben Davis, Paul Robeson, and painter Norman Lewis were regular guest speakers and where I was inculcated at an early age with the knowledge that art and politics were inseparable. I emigrated downtown to the West Village, smack dab into the apolitical beat generation where I was, she emphasizes, the only one. I moved from the West Village to the East Village where I wasn't the only one and where at that time the confluence of African countries' overthrow of colonialism and African Americans' call for black power merged with our search to transform Western forms in all areas in our search for a black aesthetic. Black arts was Cuba C and Yankee No, and fair play for Cuba parties and dancing in the streets in front of Harlem's Hotel Teresa, where Cuba's Prime Minister Fidel Castro sought sanctuary while attending a session of the United Nations. Black Arts then was the on guard for freedom, an organization of young men, and Harlem Writers Guild bursting into the Security Council Gallery on February 16th, 1961, and in those initial seconds become instantly awed and reverent. When we regained our composure, we remembered, we remembered our mission in that darkened chamber where our presence was a fissure, a fault line in the gathering of august men dividing the plunder of the Congo. Our voices ruptured the air, as Adlai Stevenson, ambassador to the United Nations, rose to deliver his maiden speech to the world. We raised the brutalized images of Congo's premier, Le, uh, premier Patrice Lumumba, betrayed by Britain, France, Belgium, and the US, and delivered to his enemies. We raised photos of his widow, Pauline, walking ahead of the mourners, her head shaved, her breasts bared before the world. What novel could compare to that? She ends. And indeed, it wasn't really something that a novel could represent, but in a way, it was something that the kind of poetry and the kind of conversation and space that the Umber Poets made could capture or did speak to in ways that we'll hear much more about from the participants themselves. Uh, and previous to this, I did prepare uh, just these brief images uh, that we might show and listen to some of the voices of those who are no longer here, particularly Tom Dent, who, as I had said before, was a member of On Guard and then uh, sort of moved downtown and refocused and met these individuals. And it was in his apartment that, uh, for the most part, as I understand, the, the group met. Beginning of civil rights no, 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 don't put the two together. They, they were, were running alongside each other. Okay. But uh, we were really talking about around our first meetings, I guess, were the summer of 62. The civil rights movement was quite underway in the South during that time. Like, the old Lower East Side was a place where many radical artists, white and black, were moving. It was cheaper. Um, it was interesting. Why could this not have been done inside already existing structures at that time? What already existing structures at that time? Okay, perhaps that's another question. Was yeah. there not? Yeah, there was the Harlem Writers Guild, which uh, was headed by John Killen and which had many friends, many, many mutual friends, and writers like Sarah Wright, Rosa Guy, Jean Carey Bond, Maya Angelou. But that group was really built around John Killens, and uh, it met in Harlem. And um, we were on the Lower East Side. We had the workshop meeting every week for about a year until we had our fight. 
That was right after Kennedy was killed. So about a year and three months. Uh, we came out of, the, of uh, a period of intense consciousness. Both of the Southern Civil Rights Movement and the Northern uh, Black Nationalists and rejection of American values. It was such an intense and intimate experience that I think all of us share it and will share it spiritually for the rest of our lives. But something's happened because it seems like really hunger is still going on. Well, spiritually, the people, the, the Umbra experience, is a, aside from the meetings of the workshop, was an extremely intense and intimate period for all of us, for all of us who were, were, uh, were closely involved. You know, what you're saying about the experience of Umbra itself, the, the real underlying thing was that all of the people involved there were and still are working on the same project and that is the project of trying to give voice to the Afro-American experience in real terms, everyday terms that relates to, you know, ordinary people. People from the Southern Civil Rights Movement who came up like uh, Charlene Hunter, who was the first black student at the University of Georgia, James Meredith, similarly at the University of Mississippi, and Andrew Young, who was working with King at that time, came to the workshop. And uh, so we were, and we had two or three people on the Lower East Side who were going down to work with SNCC and so forth. It's coming back south after those experiences brought me back to New Orleans with an extremely radical perspective uh, toward what should happen in New Orleans and with the Free Southern Theater and what kinds of exposures I felt were absolutely necessary if some kind of black cultural movement was going to begin in New Orleans and be relevant. Had I not had the Umber experience, I couldn't have had anything to offer. And I think of it as just planting seeds because it doesn't, if, if, if I was going to come back and just be like I was in New York and just do my own career, I could have stayed in New York. So to come back means to be able to see, you know, something happen, something grow that can outlive me. When you tell people how long it took and how, what's the word, strange and 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 unpredictable the, the twists and turns of the road were for each of us to whatever it is where we are now, then I don't know if people are always prepared to pay the, that kind of dues. Um, good evening and thank you for coming. Um, first let me, um, let me just try to um, tell you um, the concept of the book. Um, a novel in linked stories um, creates a structure that's a bit different from um, a regular, if there's such a thing, novel, in that um, it could be conceived of as a, a cross between prose and poetry in, in the sense of its, of its compactness and its concentration. So it, 
it tries to create some thread that links the stories together. In this case, the thread that links all the stories together is the Lower East Side. And these chapters um, reflect the biography that becomes autobiographical. Um, so in, in, the, in, in, the, in the telling of, of, of the stories, the location itself, I would like you to think of as a character, even though I don't say it's a character, but it is a character. Um, so I want to read the, the, a few pages to give you a sense of location and um, the characters are composites of people, so they may appear very real because they, they were meant to, to convey um, a person. It's late August 19, 1959 on the Lower East Side. Nusa and her small son are in the back of a taxi carrying them from the west side to the east. When the cab turns on East 10th Street, the driver curses and quickly raises the window. Nusa is temporarily these glasses are not going to work. Okay, this bit. Nusa is temporarily distracted from her sad thoughts as outside the streets are bombarded with a gushing fire hydrant. The driver's honking only adds to the sport. Children squeal in delight, running from side to side of the narrow street, clad in a variety of swimwear, panties, boxer shorts, bathing suits, skirts, blouses, trousers, whatever they were wearing when the valve was open. Clo cars slow to a stop behind them, more honking as, pa as water pummels the, ta the taxi. Jesus, where are their parents? Don't they know this is dangerous? The driver asks, but he gets no response from Nusa. It's two weeks before school is to start and the streets radiate under the late New York summer sun. From a distance, a siren wails. Cars halt, then inch slowly eastward. A police car comes up from East 10th Street, headed west, right toward them. A big red-faced cop gets out. Most of the laughing children ignore him. The policeman opens the trunk of the cruiser and takes out a familiar tool, the big wrench that shuts off water. Boo, boo, all the children soaked and dripping head to toe yell at the policeman. He does not look over, just twirls and twirls the iron rod tool until the water is reduced to a gush, a trickle, and then no more. Some of the smaller kids sit in the puddles. Others grab towels and wrap them around their bodies. The unair conditioned taxi is so hot, Nusa is, glad when, Nusa is glad when the driver opens the window. Water slides down the pane. The top of the hood glistens. At last they arrive at 404 East 10th Street. A woman she met in dance class had told her about this building. The apartments were small, but one was available on an upper floor, so Nusa went to see the owner. He also owned a furniture store on the corner of Avenue C and East 10th Street. The man had asked a lot of questions. Only one or two had to do with her ability to pay. Questions, um, uh, only one, are you on welfare? If so, I'll only take you if you give me a letter with your social worker's name and telephone number. She opened her mouth to assure him that she wasn't on welfare, but he kept on talking. Oh yeah, also that form that says the monthly rent checks will be mailed directly to me. I've had my experience with you people, so sign over the rights so the money comes directly to me or I won't give you a lease. Um, I'm going to skip. Actually, this um, is this is pretty true um, um, for me. Um, I had been living in in uh, on 24th on 24th Street, um, uh, 17 West 24th Street, which is 
sort of across from uh, Bryant Park. And I'd lived in the loft that belonged to Pearl Primus, who was at that time in Africa um, on a Rosenwald uh, fellowship where she was studying dance and dance forms and history in Liberia. And I lived there for two years. And then she was coming back, so we had to move. And so yes, I did know this person. So in many ways, it's kind of a, a, dual, a, dual, a dual situation. Um, and it sort of raises the issue about f fiction sometimes is true, as true if not truer than, uh, than the facts. Um, th and we did live at 404 East 10th Street. The building is still there. It looks very much the same way it did when we lived there, except they've got a different facade. The furniture store is no longer there. Um, um, I just wanted to sort of describe the, the, the apartment. Come Musa, up the stairs to our apartment, she directs carrying a bottle. Up, up, box, up, 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 up we go. He sings as his, he sings as his sturdy, almost five-year-old legs climb the creaking stairs. Next floor, uh, here we are, a sharp turn, and there's a door to their new dwelling. She sets the box down, finds her keys, and unlocks. Come along. The first room is bare and white. In the afternoon light from two windows at the right side of the apartment and a limited brightness from a small w kitchen window, it all looks open and fresh. She sets the box on a long counter near the sink. The little room to the left is to be the boy's bedroom. There's a small kitchen that separates his room from the largest room. It will have a dual purpose, her bedroom and a parlor. Um, and, and pretty much all of the apartments were like that. Our bathroom was, uh, the, the, the tub was in the kitchen um, and it was covered with a, um, a sort of a tin enamel top. Um, and the bath, the, the, the loo, the actual toilet, was in the hallway. Ours was in the hallway. There, I think, I think ours was the only one that was in the hallway. Other people had small had a smaller, uh, smaller room because they had created a bathroom in the um, in the in the in the bedrooms. Um, so 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 um, that that story uh, this this story kind of um, illustrates. The, what, what the space looks like and, and, and what this particular person um, um, goes through uh, and, and her, uh, her experiences of the Lower East Side. And that chapter is called In the Beginning. Um, one of the things that also happened in, in this, which is also true in my own life, um, um, uh, in, it, it, she goes, she's going to graduate school and um, and she babysits for a friend. And just so you have some background, in, 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 not in the book, uh, the person who uh, she babysits for uh, is, um, is Accra and Pavel um, Shep. Those are Archie Shep's two older boys. <clears throat> and Garth and I, his, his, their mother, and I were very were good friends. And Garth was working for a monthly review, and she was doing part time work. So I would, I would, I would babysit. We all sort of helped each other. We all sort of babysat. But in addition to that, um, Nusa works um, gets a, a, a waitress job at a, at, at a club um, that was called La Belle Creole. La Belle Creole is not the exact name, but it, there was a Haitian restaurant on Bleecker Street right off 7th Avenue South. And, um, and, and she worked there for a little while. And um, the, 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 the manager um, had, um, he had a visions of, of self-importance. And um, uh, he was using all of the, all of the profits went to supplying his friends, mostly women, um, with with meals and, and 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 wine, and he would just sign off, and never, they would never pay. 
Um, so this, uh, this, is, this is just one incident. One particular night, it's very busy and she feels a strain in her arms from the heavy tray she's carried food, food in on and the empty plates out. Without warning on this night, the big man stops by. Monsieur Louis is at his table with a larger than usual collection of freeloaders. Nusa doesn't see the big man at first because she's gone to fill a diner's request and to see the couple who've just come in out of curiosity. She puts the tray down on an empty table, serves the woman, then the man. She's making sure their order is correct when blonde number one Blonde number two raises her voice, demanding her food. Nusa excuses herself, saying to the couple, Bon appétit. She lifts the tray and goes to the table where Monsieur Louis is holding court. The cigarette holder is propped in his tobacco-stained fingers, live ash dangerously near dropping onto the wood floor. Intent on quickly serving and retreating to the back, near the kitchen where she can observe all the diners. Nusa sets two platters on the table, trying to avoid touching the chunks of pork piled high atop some stewed vegetables. She becomes aware of the abrupt halt in their shrill chatter before learning why. Standing with an empty tray, she notices Monsieur Louis's face, mouth ajar, words trickling from the other side of his lips. The cigarette holder left to its own devices. Following his stunned stare, Nusa turns and comes face to face with a very dark skinned man. Tall, elegantly dressed, his stern face focused on his partner. Bonsoir, monsieur, she says, and quickly retreats. From her position by the kitchen door in the back, she can still see her employer. In the kitchen, voices are suddenly hushed. Eyes peer through the small glass window the cook and the helpers use to monitor how business is doing. She continues to serve tables and collect money. She takes ch change back in each person, to each person, and as soon as they leave, immediately clears the dirty dishes, changes tablecloths, and sets up for the next customer. At each table, she checks on the meal and refills water glasses. Finally, unable to avoid it any longer, she approaches his table. Monsieur, may I serve you? No, mademoiselle, I'm fine. He pauses, looks around the small room as if noting it's a full house, and compliments her. You're a good worker. Merci, Merci monsieur. She runs, she picks up the empty platters quickly and takes them to the kitchen, returns with a wine and des dessert menu, and then rushes back to bring coffee in demitasse cups with a sliver of citron on the side. No one speaks while she's serving the table. She starts away, but the big man says, Mademoiselle, please bring the check. Uh, yes, monsieur. She returns to her little table in the back to tally up the bill in a quandary because Monsieur Louis, Monsieur Louise's guests are never charged. He always makes out a check and then at the table with a grand flourish, signs his name and gives it back to her. One of the men at, the, at another table gets up and heads to the men's room. A couple stands and says, well, good night. Thanks, lovely as usual. By the time Nusa gets back with the big man's check, only three of the 10 guests remain. She hands it to Monsieur Louis as, as is usual. Instead of waiting for him to sign, she leaves making herself very busy, emptying two tables. After that, she finishes the next day's setup, then sits at the little back table in the back again and chances a look at her watch, almost closing time. As she lowers her head to go over the receipts in the book, she feels a presence, the big man standing near her. Oh, yes, monsieur, she says. She rises. He gestures for her to remain seated. You've done a fine job tonight, all by yourself. Where is the other person, Jean Jean? Nusa is at a loss for words then because the waiter named Jean Jean was fired more than two months earlier for insubordination, according to Monsieur Louis. Jean Jean had not given a special cut of meat to one of his one guest at his table. 
After a loud quarrel, which almost led to a fistfight, Jean Jean was ordered out. Monsieur Louis had told Nusa, we don't need him. You can handle the room alone. He'd smiled and added, just think of all the money you'll make. Well, the first month had not been so good, but the second was better. Nusa found it hard work, though, and felt they really could use another person. But now, standing between the two men, she, sat, she is silent, looking at Monsieur Louis. He makes a great production of clearing his throat and says something in Creole, so she won't understand. But Nusa knows things are serious because normally he always speaks French proper. The big man picks up her receipt book and the two men go to the little office in the back. The dishwasher comes out and helps her stack clean glasses. He's looking at Monsieur Louis most of the time. Someone has turned on the record player. Panama um, Matombe. I don't know if you know this. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Haitian song. Um, and um, uh, the, hat, the hat falls. It's kind of a, a, a dig. Um, they play, uh, it spreads across the room. Nusa loves the soft drums and, and that hold the Haitian music together. She's almost finished setting up for the next day, though Monsieur Louis's table is still occupied by his perhaps forgotten three guests. Will there be anything more? She, she asks them, the kitchen is closing. The nasty blonde stands and looks down on her. No, that will be all. Now tell Louis we are waiting for him. Nusa smiles and agrees to do so, though in fact she has no intention of going near the back room. She continues to remove soiled glasses, plates, and silverware. Finally, the time comes, by the time she comes out of the kitchen, lays a fresh cloth and prepares to leave, she hears loud voices rising from back behind the room of the little office. The cook comes out and jabs his sous chef in the ribs. He says something in Creole and they both laugh. Nusa goes to the restroom and washes her face and hand. She is so tired, she only wants to go home. She pulls on her coat. Bonsoir, see you next week. Just as she reaches the door, a noise that sounds like the thud of a body falling breaks the silence. A moment later, the big man saunters out of the back room. Mademoiselle, he calls your night's wages. The shock of his words lands somewhere between her stomach and thigh. Tick, her left eye quivers. She hopes the spasms are not returning with the foreboding they bring. Merci, monsieur. She takes the envelope from his outstretched hand and starts towards the kitchen to share. His words stop her at the door. No, it is for you. She sees the faces of the men inside staring out and knows that they have heard too. She changes directions. The dishwasher hurries past and disappears noiselessly behind the swinging doors. Monsieur Louis comes out to, out to the door and with as much dignity as possible, emerges from the back room, hat cocked at its usual rakish angle. He pauses at the door to fluff his gold and blue cravat then with an exaggerated flourish, swings a camel hair coat over his shoulder. Odd, his ever-present cigarette holder is no longer affixed to his lip. This is something, so, something a bit off, there is something a bit off here, or perhaps it's only her imagination. The swollen lip, the somewhat crooked nose. Just then he takes one of those famous white handkerchiefs, holds it to his face, so she isn't certain if that was indeed a trickle of blood on his chin. He slides past, back rigid, feet carrying him swiftly to the door. One hand flips the cocky adieu. Nusa is mesmerized for a moment at the audacity of the little man. Good night again, monsieur. The big man, she says to the big man, thank you for your kindness, see you next week. Mademoiselle, please call first. This, this actually, um, I mean, it actually happened, and it's interesting when you start to write something like this, how much you, you think you're writing fiction, but you realize how much you recall. Um, characters in this particular uh, story, Hollis. Hollis Frampton lived in my building. He was a, a very fine 
um, experimental um, filmmaker. So I use his name, although in the other in, in other stories I don't use the the, the 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 quote real person's name. But I used his name because he is dead, and I wanted to remember him and have him situated as he was in my life on the Lower East Side. He was a very very good friend. Um, the other stories um, either have the name of the street or a person that I associate with the street. Um, another, uh, another story in here um, in, in, invokes um, the memory of the NEC, the Negro Ensemble Company, and, um, and, and, the, and, and that's done uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a character. That's a character's name is Bill. I'll just read this one very quick line. Bill, do not be persuaded by the current times, Bill says from the center stage. Africa will not always be as you find it today, as you left it. Be confident of your status now and take comfort temporarily. Yet surely as day follows night, my children will meet yours as equal. Where is up to you? He pauses, takes a deep breath, and walks off into the wings. The curtain comes down, lights out, and then up. All the while, there's applaud. He leads the cast of five back on. They bow a choreographed one, two, three, five and all. Bill turns away first, and the rest follow him off stage. Um, um, the other, the, there, are other, there are other stories uh, that have just um, the, the, the name of, of the person or the, 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 the street. So after Bill is Hussein. Hussein is, uh, is an African who, who comes to move on the Lower East Side, has a kind of typical African uh, Lower East Side experience. And, I, and, I, and I, I start then to add to the location and the, the experiences so that a lot of the action in, in Hussein, and, and that follows sometimes in other of the stories, was a bar called Stanley's. I don't, I, I mean, most of you here are kind of young. Stanley's been gone for a while. But Stanley's was sort of like, I guess what, David? It was like our, it was like the Lower East Side's answer to Cedars, right? I mean, it was real, it was more real than, than Cedars. Um, Mm hmm It was kind of like that. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's gone, too. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, Stanley's, hey, Stanley's, Stanley's was, a, was a bar on, what, Avenue B, Avenue, Avenue A, and uh, b between, B, between 12th and 13th. It was right on the corner. It was, huh? Yeah, but it was on the, yeah, that's what I said, on the corner. And, and the thing I remember was this, was this thick, thick glass and, and really nice wood. Um, and there was like a little back room where the, the, you know, the real artists hung out and they had the serious conversations. So you sort of had to qualified to be at that at that table and and I guess a lot of people always want you know you always want to hang there so Hussein has his experience is 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 there um, Hussein um, is studying and he is a, a, a photographer and um, and he has moved into this very small apartment and um, he has a, a really interesting experience about a month later, his first sighting of roaches, having developed a thirst, he had his first experience of, of roaches. Having ex developed a thirst from writing and then reading aloud the last few paragraphs of a paper due in a few days, he gets up, stretches his arms overhead, and flexes cramped hands. The long fingers open shut. He goes to the kitchen sink and turns on the tap, letting the water run a minute. Remembering his grandmother's caution that ice water is bad for the stomach, he does not keep a jug in the fridge. He turns on the overhead light and sees something dark 
covers the counter, a moving tablecloth of brown bugs. He freezes and almost shouts. At first, he's shocked to see all the cockroaches fleeing over white enamel tops and down the white table legs, following the leader across the floor and under the sink. Whoosh, they are gone. All thoughts of thirst and water vanish. What if this army, this insect brigade, should return while he's asleep? His skin crawls and puckers as if a thousand slimy bodies are crawling all over him, up his legs and chest. <coughs> he shivers and shudders. Now they will be inching their way up his neck and chin. A smell of decay and rotting cabbage so vivid it seems real perfumes their steady march across his face. He imagines trying to wake up, to push them all off. His lips clamp down. Saliva fills his mouth. He turns to the sink, certain he will vomit, but no. At last he washes out his mouth, splashes his face. He sets the water gla glass inside, um, upside down on a clean, dry table. After that, it's difficult to focus on kinetic abstraction and the discipline of idiomatic composition. Finally, he pushes away his pad. Um, even as a child, he hated insects, the huge bugs that collected around their carafts. His uncle crafted an airtight top so they were unable to creep in and pollute the water. But sometimes when disturbed by sudden motion or light, they would fly up to escape. One time, he must have been around eight. He made the mistake of coming into the kitchen cooking area to get something. He no longer remembers what. The scratching and rustling countless bristly legs across the wooden tabletop and the ones that flew around his head all made him flail his arms to shield his face and strike out wildly. One scurried under his foot and then when he took a step, the chitinous shell burst. The horror of the glutinous ooze beneath his, feet, his bare soul froze him to the spot. When he was finally able to move, the insect flesh stuck to the curve of his arch. Hussein smiles, recalling how he washed his feet again and again and again to rid them of the slime. Now, almost 20 years later, he's plotting how to revenge himself on the bugs, America's co American cousin. Tomorrow, first thing, he'll go back to the general store and tell the Puerto Rican shopkeeper he needs to buy the most effective, powerful bug killer. And then he, he gets all this stuff and he, ki and he, kills, and he kills them. But <clears throat> what's interesting is I had had, a sim okay, I'd had a similar experience where I, we have different kinds of cleaning materials so I didn't know that there were things that you couldn't, um, that you couldn't mix. And when, we, when <clears throat> I moved from my f where we were staying in Harlem to Pearl Primus's apartment just before we moved to the Lower East Side, she had been gone for a few weeks before I moved in, maybe about a month, and she had a cat. And it was a, a heavy, heavy coated cat, uh, I think an Angora. And so there was cat hair, and she had this rug. It was really, really not clean. It was not clean. And I was trying to clean it. So I would use one cleaner for the bath, one cleaner for the toilet, and something like with soap to wash other things. And then I would go back uptown. And by the time I got uptown, I was wheezing as if I was having an asthmatic attack. And I never had asthma, so I didn't know what to think. And there was a, 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 a hospital right at the corner of 130th and Convent called the Knickerbocker Hospital. And it was, it was segregated. But I didn't realize, I didn't know it was segregated. I mean, after all, it was in Harlem. But it, it, it was, it, it, they, didn't, uh, they didn't like uh, to have black uh, patients. So, so I went there, and, and, then, and, and, and now I know what, he, at the time I didn't know what he was hinting. He, he was suggesting that I was overdose, but I didn't know what it meant, so I didn't take offense. And then somebody walked by, and I said, 
every evening. He said, he's, so they asked me to describe, describe what, how, what was happening. And I said to them, you know, I'm, I'm, we're moving and I've been cleaning. So maybe it's a cat here. I don't know. I, I clean. I do this. I do that. And then he, somebody brilliant says, well, what do you use to clean? And I was using uh, bleach for something and ammonia for something else, which is toxic. I, but I didn't know because I'd never used these, these kinds of things before, you know. So I was actually poisoning. So I put that in there. I'm just, I'm just talking now just about how you can construct um, a, 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 real, a, a, a very real um, um, a, a very a, a reality a reality in your in your fiction that gives it that gives it a, a kind of grounding that it doesn't sound quote fictitious so so yes it is an it it is an autobiography but it's a fictitious autobiography and the people in the in here as I said are composites there's <clears throat> there's one chapter that talks a little bit about about uh, the, the title of the, the, that chapter is Charlie, and Charlie is one of the writers, and so it's very much fashioned on Umbra specifically. That's the most, I think that's the most, most direct re reference to Umbra, although I don't use any of those characters' names and I don't say Umbra, but that's what I'm talking about. So I think maybe I stop now and I think we're going to have a, a sort of a discussion. Okay. Maybe you could start what the plot is. So uh, thanks again for coming and uh, for enjoying Rashida's great fiction. Thank you. Um, and while David's uh, on his way, but um, maybe we could start. I thought it was most interesting maybe for you guys to hear a little bit about beyond the fictional part, um, the actual Umbra workshop and how you first got involved with them and maybe a little bit about what happened when you guys would get together as a group. Um, if you could just oh. the recording. Uh, um, well, I, I, came to, I came to Umbra um, via Tom Feelings. Um, Tom Feelings, um, for th those of you who may not know who he was, Tom Feelings was a very, very fine and a very important um, African-American visual artist. <clears throat> he was a very generous, a very generous person. And he, he is from the other very strong African-American community in Bed-Stuy. And in fact, after he died, they managed to get a, 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 a street where he was born, name, named for him. Um, and Tom, I met Tom in 1960. Um, he, the, the, I don't know how much you know about Africa at that time, but uh, Nkrumah was, 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 the, was the first uh, prime minister of Ghana. And he had sent out the call because he'd lived here for, for, for about 10 years and he lived in Harlem during this time. And, um, and he sent out the call for African Americans to come to Ghana 
and to be a part of the building of a Pan-African nation. And from there spread incorporating the diaspora. And Tom had apparently gone to one of these, uh, one, to, had met the third secretary from the Ghana mission. And they were trying to overhaul the books in the, uh, the, the, the textbooks. So Tom was being, was, being, was being spoken to come to Ghana and to create um, a more African looking uh, um, 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 textbooks and stories and, and in the process show other uh, uh, um, artists how to do that. And he was talking about, you know, uh, how you work with uh, the, the, the making, making pigment um, reflect uh, the, 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 the colorations and the shadings, etc. cetera. Um, and so Tom, so I, I'm in the third secretary was, was someone that I knew. So we, so he had a little gathering and I went and I met Tom I met Jean Carey Bond, um, whose husband, Max Bond, wa went to Ghana and created, um, and, and he was an architect, and he, um, he, he, he built uh, the, uh, the library at, at the University of Legon. He also did the one here at the Schomburg. He built, he, that, that's Max Bond's uh, architecture. So I met Tom. I met Tom there, and we. And so I said, "Okay, well, why don't you come? I'm I'm living on the Lower East Side, and why don't you come over and have dinner sometime?" He said, "Okay, I like that." And he said, "You know, I've got some friends who live down there, and um, you know, they they're writers and they're doing all these things, etc." So he brought me there to Tom Dent's little apartment, and um, that's how I I met I met everybody. I guess the thing that really, uh, I still, I think when I, hear, when I heard from Tom talking about how, 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 how interesting that a quote organization or, or group or workshop could have such a long lasting effect on you when it was so in fact short lived, maybe because the people who did it were already activists, but also artists, and, and so they had that, and, and that led them to want to keep an organization. So, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but I, 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 I really appreciate it when I heard, when I heard that now. So I, that's, how I met, I, that's how I met everybody, and I, I mean, the Lower East Side at that time lended itself, I think it lent itself very easily to, to having a kind of a community because on the one hand, there were a lot of us, but on the other hand, there weren't a lot of us. It's just that it was more than we expected to have. And since we were surrounded by so much whiteness, five or 10 people seemed like a lot, especially when we got together, because we weren't used to being, at least I wasn't, in that kind of, of situation. Everybody took themselves very seriously. Everybody really felt that they were, they were writers, they were painters, they, I mean, they took that very seriously. But it wasn't just that, it was that they also took um, intelligence, you know, they, they, we, shared, we shared things, I mean, David was, was horrible to have a conversation with because he always had about four or five other references. If you said you read this, he'd say, well, did you, well what about so-and-so? And what do you think would so-and-so would do? And, and you, you, you didn't know what he was going to come up with. So you had to really read a lot of stuff because he'd really just keep hounding you. And I used to think he was doing that until he found one thing that you either hadn't seen, heard, or read. And then he'd just expound on that, you know. Um, but you, you stayed on your toes because you really, as the expression was, you couldn't hang if you, if, you, if, you, if you didn't know and you weren't willing to read and you weren't willing to experience, you really couldn't hang. Because people like David was so, 
was merciless. So that's how I got to Humber. What, uh, yeah. Uh, David, I, you know, in those clips that you heard when, we, when I put, played that little bit, um, uh, my friend uh, who's here, Lady Perez, and I were down in New Orleans in uh, January looking at Tom Dent's papers in the, the Amistad Research Center at Tulane and uh, listening to these voices, uh, and I had heard both of their voices often before that, but um, David, I remember one moment, and there's an interview that you're listening to at the end of those clips from 1982 in Houston, and you heard briefly, uh, first you heard Tom, and then you heard another Umbra poet, Lorenzo Thomas, uh, speaking uh, about organization and the way that organization was something that you took away from Umbra. Uh, that's not part of the clips I played, but it's a part where you're speaking later. Um, that the, For you, that was one of the most valuable parts. Uh, you addressed that issue of organization and what organization meant to you coming out of Umbra. I don't know if you recall that conversation, but... Uh, Are you going to use it? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It seems important well, and maybe you want to... Send it to me. I will. You do a lot of research, but I haven't seen any of it yet. Well, you read my dissertation. Well, I have your dissertation, yeah. But that's, the, that's the research, research. <laughs> that's research, the film stuff and whatever. Yeah, well, that's all new. Huh? That's all brand new. Well, I'm looking forward to getting it, awesome. you know, <laughs> because um, there's a lot of research to be done. Yes. And um, it's good that it's getting done. Yes. There's a lot of distortions around Umbra. So it's good that we, once that happens, we have a chance to clear them up. But I want to point out that um, Umber was not short-lived. Uh, the magazine was, and the actual physical workshop was. Mm. But uh, I still work with Umber people to this day. Right. That's true. You know, That's true. And, uh, and Umber had a periphery. We were a core for a bunch of people of color and white folks and all kinds of people living on the, in the Lower East Side. In this village, and um, like, because um, this signal you know, there was Chandra and her mother and uh, Berta lived around the corner from where we had the workshop, which was on second off of C. And they were living on um, first off of C. Well, they call oh, that's right. They call it Second Street, but at that point, First Street had disappeared. Right. When you get back to Avenue A. That's the end of First Street. Right. So you were on Second Street. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Daddy was on Third Street, and then we lived on Second Street. Yeah. 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 But Tom lived on Second Street, too. Tom was on Third. No, no, Tom okay. was on Second. Okay. No, he wasn't on Third, because the Third is where the project is now. And they didn't, that project was there when Tom was there. But the project across from the New Yorkian. The building. building. Yeah, it's a project. You can have the project with one building. Yeah, well. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is not a, a, a quiz show, you know. But um, but anyway, uh, a lot of people say Umber was short-lived, and it's important that it's not because we still cooperate. Um, Steve Cannon is still living on the low east side, East Village. And he has something now called a Gathering of the Tribes, a very effective organization. I think it's their 20th anniversary or 25th. Um, yeah, a Gathering of the Tribes. Uh, and he and Ishmael Reed published a number of books for years called the Reed, Cannon, and Johnson, Reed and Cannon Publishers. And then Joe Johnson, who's also an original member of Umbra, they all three published some books together. Um, we, a bunch of us moved to the West Coast, uh, <laughs> uh, and where Ishmael moved and where Joe Overstreet was, and we had a group called Ninth Generation Artists where we did stuff out there, you know, and, um, and Lorenzo and I collaborated and talked about Pacifica Foundation, I was doing documentaries at, at Fort Spell out in Berkeley at KPFA, which is the mother station of Pacifica. And Lorenzo was in Houston where Pacifica built its last station, at least to this present time. K W oh, I don't know the call letters, KPF something or other. Yeah. 
in um, Houston, which of course had been bombed several times by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so, you know, uh, we, uh, and, and Tom was doing the uh, Heritage Foundation in New Orleans, the Heritage Festival, which he became the head of in New Orleans after having gone to the Free Southern Theater during the Civil Rights Movement when he left New York. And um, I, w I went down there and worked with the theater for a while. That was a great experience because it was um, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. So, I mean, um, I think that what happened with Umbra and, the, and um, just to name a few of the people's experience, I mean, uh, Askia Muhammad Ture went to, to Atlanta and was working with SNCC uh, and was there when um, the women had a beef with SNCC, uh, and that was a historic occasion. But, of course, a lot of other really important things happened historically. Um, and I could go on and on about uh, the Umber people. Lennox Raphael uh, went back to Trinidad and became the uh, press secretary to the prime minister of, of, of Trinidad. His wife, Mary Ann, uh, they were an interracial couple. He, she, she's white from Ohio. She went on to write a book about Mother Teresa and other, other books, you know. So, I mean, um, Brenda Walcott, who was a, a, a originally a dancer in the group, uh, went on to become a playwright, live up in um, Cambridge, married Calvin Hicks, uh, uh, and they had some beautiful children together who are up there in the, in, in the north. Um, Askia Muhammad Ture is up there now um, uh, in that part of the world. There's a lot of really interesting inter interconnections, but of course our base was the Lower East Side, East Village, and I think that, I try to point out, Chandra, that area on 2nd Street, between, on Avenue C, that was hardly the East Village. I don't know what you call that, but... It, it was ABC. Well, excuse me. I don't know why you all are saying this. I mean, I'm not asking what people call it. You know, I'm telling you, I'm trying to say something about um, the fact that while a lot of places near there are called the East Village, that's not the East Village. And why isn't it the East Village? Uh, we used to call it the Lower Side because, for one thing, when you cross Houston Street, there's a bank of projects, of low-income housing projects, that go all the way down across Delancey Street, which is right here, and continues down to where they have uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, co-ops. And, and some of the housing over here on between Houston and Delancey is co-ops, high-rise co-ops and projects. And then the projects, of course, go up Avenue D all the way to 14th Street. So Umber, we used to make it a point to go over to Avenue D, to this little bar they had there in D and Third Street, which was a black bar, like from Harlem. You know, and we used to go in there and party. Yeah, there was Slugs and Pee Wees, and we would go to Slugs and Pee Wees. But I'm talking about Avenue D. Huh? Why don't you just bring her the mic? Why don't you just bring her the mic? What? I don't think it'll reach her. Look at this cord. They could sit in there. We have to work this stuff out. I mean, you know. Oh, please. So my question is, my question is when. She lives on East A Street, by the way. Oh, tell everybody. Well, you're East Village, yeah. Okay, apart from that. When you were actively involved in the Umbra workshops, were the projects there? When you are talking about Avenue D had this bar, yeah. had the projects been built? Yeah, Lillian Wall, they were built. Okay. Well, they should know in the Tenement Museum, right? When were they built, Lillian Wall? Well, they were built, they were built, I would think, at least in the 50s. But I remember when I was a child, and a, a, a tween, I used to go down with my friend to visit his family in those projects uh, around 10th or 12th Street. 
So they were, they've been there for a while. But of course, something I'm going to talk about tonight, and that's why I began by talking about how we regarded that particular area where the workshop was and where Verda and her children lived and, and where Steve Cannon had tribes on 3rd Street between C and D and uh, so it was so close to the projects because that was not the East Village. There was another, something that's not categorized now and of course one thing is still there true about that area is that there is nothing cultural except for that, New York, that public library in the corner of D and Halston. But there's nothing there. And the, the thing we did have at one point during that point was they had the bar, that restaurant on Avenue A and between Halston and uh, 2nd Street. What was it called? Not the, sh the people who ran the shark bar owned that. Remember that restaurant there that sold soul food? Now, that's the only soul food, uh, one of the rare few soul food restaurants down in that part of town where you have a whole lot of black people and Latinos and people of color. Now the Latinos managed to keep a few restaurants, which I say some of them have um, keep the food warm with light bulbs over them, you know, which I think is, in the window, which I think is beautifully classic. But anyway, to point out, <laughs> I know, I think it's great. I, wanna, <laughs> I think it's, it's so economical, too, you know? I mean, it just works, you know? <laughs> but, you know, um, something occurred to me at a point when I was at the African burial ground, which is on Reed Street, right off of Foley Square. And I did point out a lot, and I went to the museum, and I looked at artifacts. I read Dick Dickens' piece on Five Points, which is a black neighborhood uh, there, is that black people lived in that area from, from, the, from the beginning of, this, of, of, of America, 1600, 1600s, and that we lived down here longer than we lived in Harlem, and longer than most people who are here now, including the immigrants. Now, for one thing, if you look at the map in the African Burr Ground, where Chinatown is now was where black folks live. And then it continued up towards around here. But um, the Chinese didn't come to 1870, I am told. Now, I know there was a migration. No? They were here earlier. Earlier than the 18th, in Chinatown? So the blacks and the Chinese were there at the same time? OK, they were making a transition, I suppose. Uh, we all crashed in part. Well, you must come up here and speak in the microphone. Okay, I will speak and in so the microphone. And so you can get your visage on that. Hello, on the my name is Chandra Ursul Grovener, and uh, I grew up on the Low East Side. I've known Rashida and David Henderson since I was a little girl. But, you know, my experience down here was so much, I didn't realize that we were few. In fact, when I left the Low East Side, and if anyone left, left the loop of our thing, I was surprised that they were white people that were talented because uh, <laughs> I couldn't like, I did not realize that white people could play the djembe, white people could do African dance, that white people were artists. My experience was so different because we were so, it was so culturally rich where my mother, she's a Verda Mae Smart Grosvenor, she wrote a book, Vibration Cooking, and our house was like the cultural center, you know, and where we went, you know, with our mother to see. I really did not know, even though my father is white, but I went with my mother to all of these black cultural things. So I really thought that, I thought that we were like, you know, that we, were, we were a tribe and we were so mixed too. We had this like mixed tribe and everybody was all into this mixed, you know, uh, but it was this black, rich culture. So I didn't realize that, you know, when I came back and got to be an adult, I was like, where did all the white people come from? Mm. You know, it was very different experience for me. You know, so, you know, it's very different experience. But I'm just, and, and, but the Umbra, you know, and everyone, it, like, they did, it, it didn't seem sure it lived to me. I mean, I, I just, it's, it, it's still going on. The magazine. 
what, when I say when I say when I say short lived, we I all I was talking about was the, the publication. The, not only the publication, but just that every week kind of thing, where we were meeting in, uh, you know, and workshopping. I just meant that was that particular, that particular aspect of it. Because you all, but, but you we all, all, but we all stayed. We all stayed in touch. We all knew right, what was doing. right. So it wasn't. It wasn't like. Right, because you all were inspirational yeah. to so many of us and still are, you know, and still are. So I could still consider you all still, you know, very vibrant and inspirational. And we'll so. Thank Tom, you. Tom, Thank you. Tom spoke Thank about that in those remarks. About yeah. what? About the fact that it, the workshop itself was only maybe a year, a little more than a year long, and the publication, but that you, your connections were so uh, important and, and that they and lived on after that. Yeah. So. And I think probably so because then I wasted your time you by shared, saying what I said, or what are you, what are you I saying? I think, no, I'm just saying that I think that process of, 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 of sharing your work, of bearing, of bearing your, your soul in a sense, of, 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 of being with people on a weekly basis, um, struggling through a paragraph, a scene, a chapter, an idea that hasn't fully developed, um, and 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 listening to other people do the same thing. That that's a very very intense emotional, and intellectual and creative experience. And I don't think you walk away from that, whether it's one year or 20 years, you don't walk away, in a sense, you don't really walk away from that. Some of the structure, the physical structure, may, 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 be, may not be there, but, but, but that, that intensity of, of sharing is, is, still, is still there. I mean, I mean when, 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 when Archie and, and, and Garth, um, had to had to leave their building because they were building Cooper Cooper Village, which is called Cooper Square Village or whatever. They didn't leave the building. They're still there. Twenty seven Cooper Square is still there. No, 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 no. When they lived in a tenement, oh. that tenement, that whole block was torn down and, 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 and a development was put there. From there they moved to Cooper to Cooper Square. But they moved even further because he then started to teach at uh, at the at, at University of, uh, at at, at, at uh, UMass, and so the family then literally moved away from from there. So, so so there were I when I saw when I saw Akra, I didn't even know him because he wasn't this little baby that I used to have. One 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 pillow was was Accra and the other pillow was Dawood. We're kind of getting off the subject, don't we? No, I'm talking. Can we keep talk about I'm more. not getting off the subject, David. I'm I'm saying that that intensity, that bond, that bond was 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 still there. And 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 when you were talking about this this tribe, this community, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That 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 during that time when I'm experiencing. Umbra, I'm experiencing Umbra as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, perhaps a writer, but I, I saw myself perhaps as a writer. I saw them as writers because they had already kind of figured out a lot of things. And, and, and I was, I was just putting sentences and words together. Archie was writing music and, 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 and talking about the connection between politics and, 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 and music and how music is also political. And, and, and so all of these things were happening, but when people started to move, physically move away, I think the intensity of what we shared kept us connected, even though some people, as you say, like Ismail and you, went out to California and, and Archie and Garth moved up to Massachusetts, and I didn't see them for years and years and years and years and years. I see Pavel as an adult, but this is a child that I, in many ways, nurtured for about a year w along with my son. So, and yet still, I felt a bond there. That's what I'm talking about. 
but maybe we could have a few questions from, from folks to, for both of these guys. Do we have any time for that? Even one? Yeah, we do. We have time for just a, a couple of questions. So it's not Thank you. Oh, hi. I'm Gabriela Sonam. Hi. And oh, hi. Good. Um, I have a question about what it was like to be a female writer Thank in you. that era and how you perceived it at the time and how you might perceive it differently or similarly now looking back on it from, from your perspective today. Um, hmm. Well, the, the, the Noosa character, I think, is some of what of a composite of some of the things that I, that I experienced. And I, and, I, and I use Noosa as a way of trying to talk about what it was like to be a black woman in, in, at that time in, on the Lower East Side or in Alphabet City um, in the 60s where all kinds of things and barriers were, were being erupted and taken down. Um, there, there, I, I, would, I, would, I would like to, you know, in spite of what people will say, I will say it from my point of view, it was not always easy to be a black woman during this time. You, you had to f try to really find a way to be a black woman. There were ways in which black men were allowed to be black and male, and, and, and in a way, heroic. That, in my experience, was not so for black women. And when, and, 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 and when black women tried to say that, especially to black men, very often I felt they were not listened to or they were seen as making a statement against black men. And that isn't what we were, at least I wasn't, and a lot of the women that I knew weren't saying that. The, 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 the way in which race and sexual politics came in was very serious. And it, and it, and it did have, to some extent, some debilitating effects. Um, there was open talk that black women did not understand what it meant to be an artist and the sacrifices that it meant to be an artist. And these were some of the reasons, excuses, that black men would use to, quote, justify their, 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 their choices of partners. That was not allowed black women when black women found someone that they could be with and that person was a white male, very often she was, she, was, she was ostracized. When I was on the Lower East Side at this particular time, it was a very difficult personal time for me because I was separating from, from my husband. I was very alone. I didn't have people to understand the culture from which I came and why I needed, why I needed community. I needed male community, not as a bed partner. I needed male community because in my culture, if a man is not there, the father of the child is not there, you go and you get a man from the community and he, he takes the child somewhere. I just wanted to, to say, hello, brother, let's talk. But there was this code that if, if, if men, if, if it was perceived that black men were talking to, what, to black women, it would lower their chances of, of, of being seen as available. White women, that was a chance, I think, that black, that, that we're, I think racial politics played a negative role because the solidarity that could have occurred between black women and white women was fraught with rivalry. Maybe black men didn't see it that way, but, but, but black women perceived it. I'll give you, for instance, there was a club called Boomers. I don't know if anybody remembers Boomers. It was on Bleecker Street. It was a wonderful jazz club. I mean, you could, it was really great. One night I went in with, 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 with an ex, and we were sitting at the table, and, and this white woman who was a waitress came, and she literally did this to I'm sitting here, and she does this. May I help you? In between us, 
obviously was sitting together. So fortunately, he did like that. And she just gave me a look. I can tell you that a lot of black women had that experience on the Lower East Side. And unfortunately, sometimes we have that experience now. And I think when those experiences happen, if you don't have a good, strong sense of yourself, and if you don't have some kind of political sensibility, you're going to misread that, and you'll, you, 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 you'll categorize it totally as a racial situation, or you'll be put off and you won't even bother. During this time that, that, that Chandra is talking about, I had, I had three friends that we are still like sisters. One is a white woman who was married to a black man who was an actor. She had two, two daughters with him. The other was a, is, is, is a, an African-American woman who had three children, two from her first white husband and, two from, and one from a, a white lover, whatever. And, and the other is a Puerto Rican and Jamaican. And she has two girls. We, our children were brought up like brothers and sisters, just like Chandra said. We had this, uh, uh, we had this real sense, and I don't know if it was like us against the world, but we really did think that there was something going on in the Lower East Side that had to do with politics, it had to do with intelligence, that this was an intellectual, political community, and somehow it was us against the rest of the world. And when we came into that space, we were in this intellectual place. Umbra was great because it was primarily black, and it was a place where you could be black, right? Um, and, 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 and so for me, it had great emotional um, uh, importance. And, and the people that I met there are still very important to me. Um, but there were other, there were, there, it was also an, had, this area has a, a, a history of anarchism. When he, when, when, when Evan was talking about On God and, and, and organizations like that, it's a very strong uh, anarchistic and, and communist uh, uh, left leaning uh, history in this area that, that, that also, I think, made Umbra so, so, so vital. And, and we were, we were, we were, we saw ourselves as continuing, continuing, continuing that. But there, but, the, but I mean, let's not, there was, there was this, there was the, there was the, the sexual uh, politics that were going on then. So I'm afraid we are out of time now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's obviously more to be said uh, about this context and, and these people. But thank you very much for coming out. And um, I'm sure that we can, uh, have, can carry on the conversation elsewhere if people wish to. Yeah, thank so. you, Rashida, Eben, David, for coming. Um, if you all